welcome to the Cardano Community Podcast. Today, we have as a guest Dr. Lars Brunius, who is the director of education at IOHK. Lars has spent a lot of time in regions like Africa, India, and led a course in Ethiopia, where 22 women had the chance to learn Haskell, and also in Barbados, where 10 students learned functional programming thanks to IOHK. Without further ado, welcome on the show, Lars, and it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much, Max. I'm very happy to be here. Um, let's introduce yourself. Right, so um, I'm Lars, I'm German, and uh, I, by training I'm a mathematician, so I um, studied mathematics in Cologne and then did my PhD in Regensburg. Spent some uh, one year in Cambridge as a postdoc and then some more years at university teaching. And uh, I'm so I'm really passionate about that. But I've also always been passionate about programming. And I think I first learned heard about Haskell during my year at Cambridge in the early 2000s. And then, uh, even though professionally I worked on more standard technologies like C Sharp, .NET, uh, JavaScript, I always in my spare time um, did some Haskell for relaxation. And so I was very excited then. <laughs> um, when this opening at IHK appeared and I applied. So yes, I'm passionate about um, mathematics, about programming, and also about teaching. That's somehow in my genes because my mother was a teacher and um, a very good one, I think, also a math teacher. And um, I've always loved explaining and uh, teaching. So at university, I, I had these uh, assistant jobs uh, with uh, tutorials and so on. And I always really enjoyed that. So I was very happy to get these chances at IHK to, to teach. So why, why IHK specifically? Why did you join in 2016 IHK? Was there a specific reason? It was mostly the Haskell. I mean, <clears throat> as I said at my previous job, um, uh, it was like standard technologies and they, yeah. it was a very big company, so they weren't flexible. They weren't open to introducing new Mm -hmm. things. I mean, .NET, Microsoft, I mean, C Sharp is Microsoft, and they also have a functional programming language, F Sharp, which is very similar to OCaml, actually. And a couple of times I tried to introduce that for little projects at my old company, and uh, it was always blocked. And so mm -hmm. I got more and more yeah. frustrated. And then eventually decided I want to, to, to get a job where I can do Haskell. And then at that time, I was lucky that IHK was looking, so I applied. So it wasn't the blockchain thing in the first place. I mean, that's very interesting mathematically yeah, yeah. and also lots of potential to change the world for the better. But my main motivation was actually the, the Haskell. I found it cool that such an interesting company uses Haskell as their main development language. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And why Haskell? Why? why... Why are you passionate about it? Is there a specific thing which makes it so different from these other languages? Yes, definitely. I mean, first of all, I just like exotic languages um, <laughs> because I, th I, I think it's it's always good if if you are challenged to to have to uh, if you're forced to to think in different ways. I think mm -hmm. even yeah. if in your day job you you do a standard language, uh, this different perspective from exotic languages can always help. And that, I mean, can be anything, can be Prolog or Forth or, or Haskell. Uh, so that's the one thing. But I think Haskell in particular is, is especially nice. I mean, it's somehow very mathematical. I mean, the, in its history, it's more inspired by mathematics and less by engineering. So that suits me, of course. And I think it's very extremely elegant. It's very flexible. So, um, so it allows you to allows you to express a lot of of complicated invariants and so on in in the language itself. And it's very um, very little noise. I mean, no semicolons at line ends and no curly brackets. And um, mm -hmm. yeah. So so it's very sparse and very um, elegant. And you're also creative because it has this two-dimensional layout. So you, white space is actually significant in Haskell. So, so you can somehow even structure your code that it's um, that looks nice and, and meaningful how you how you indent it and so on. And uh, so I think it's a beautiful language to express um, ideas and basically uh, like mathematical ideas or all sorts of ideas um, in in code so that you can then actually run it. And because of its features, it's very safe and uh, powerful. So I think it's it's a beautiful compromise between um, an interesting research language and an actual practical language. So it's mm -hmm. a, yes. So 
I think it's really a beautiful language. Okay, that's very interesting to hear. Um, I, I've always thought it was really interesting to, to understand all these differences between all these languages because mm -hmm. as a non-programmer, you don't often understand all these differences, but apparently there are a lot. And so uh, it, it's interesting how all these languages differ and how you can use them for different purposes. Uh, right. While you may think that you can just use one language for everything, but that's not the case. I mean, in principle, of course, theoretically, all the so-called two incomplete languages, which are most of them, in principle, you can do everything. I mean, mm -hmm. every you can solve every problem in any language if it's two incomplete, which most of them are most standard languages. But uh, that doesn't mean that it's it's a pleasure to express a certain project in <laughs> in a given language. Okay. Okay. Um, and um, I mean, as you said, sorry, um, these um, okay. differences, I mean, some of the languages are indeed very similar. I mean, it's more like syntax. So in one language, it's called uh, mm -hmm. whatever. I mean, loop and then the other four. And, uh, and there are some small syntactic uh, differences. So for example, Java and C sharp um, are very similar. They are differences, but it doesn't really uh, require a different way of thinking. But I mean, some languages like this functional Haskell versus the mainstream imperative languages or object oriented languages, uh, you really have to, to think about pro problems differently. And that I find fascinating. So, mm -hmm. so in the one, I mean, the mainstream Java, so you basically think step by step, what does the computer have to do now and then and then, whereas in functional languages, you more, it's more declarative. So you basically give mm -hmm. it the rules and so it's it's a totally different way of thinking and that I find fascinating. Definitely. So now speaking about Haskell and the uh, Ethiopia course, uh -huh. now that a lot of time has passed, uh, what are your thoughts about it? What, what was your experience? I'm, I mean, it was very, very important experience for me. So I called it the highlight of my professional life. So, and I, I still stand by that. So, so it was very powerful for me because it combined all the things I like, as I said before, I mean, mathematics, Haskell, teaching, but it also um, really felt meaningful because I mean, going to a country like Ethiopia and, and especially helping women there. Mm -hmm. so, so it really felt as if I was able to make a difference. So I had fun with Haskell and fun with teaching. Plus, um, it, it felt like a really important work to do. So, so it was a great experience. And we hope to um, repeat it or something similar next year when we do a course in Mongolia, a similar course. OK, so there will be a course next year in Mongolia with Haskell. Yes, I mean, it's it's always hard to say yeah. things are moving so fast. But but right <laughs> now, all the signs <laughs> say that, yes, we will do a course in Mongolia next year. OK, that, that, that's really great uh, to hear. Um, do, do, do we know what these women have become? Are they currently working with Haskell? Are they, um, or are they in this tech industry now? Like, how how is it going? Um, I know that uh, we made most of them an offer, and a, a big bunch of them are working for IHK. Some of them with Haskell, but also now um, that Cardano slowly becomes more mature, we also mm -hmm. have these uh, this enterprise branch Atala which yeah, is Scala based yeah, yeah. actually, and um, Pluto. So the idea is also to, to use them for projects like that. So um, then work okay, on Scala yeah, but... or Pluto. Yeah, I, I really love the idea of educating people from the start and then making them work in your company. It's it, yes. it shows that IOHK does things great because a lot of courses, they just give a course, but the level of the course isn't high enough for you to go and work in that company, but here it shows really that it was a high level course. Yes, indeed. And I, I truly believe that it's the right way to, I mean, that it's it's good that we do Haskell and that even if they then afterwards maybe work on Scala or Plutus or something, mm -hmm. because Haskell, as uh, Charles always says, it's this, this great filter. I mean, because it's like a very pure, um, language. So, so some of the idea is that if you are trained in Haskell, then you it's relatively easy for you to also learn these other technologies. So, so I'm a big believer in that. And yes, I'm very glad that we we try to offer every uh, buddy that passes our courses um, a job if we if we can. I mean that 
because uh, it's always said that um, a lot of countries suffer from this brain drain where the best and brightest then <laughs> once they got an education they leave to the us or to europe yeah so i'm very proud that we uh, offer an alternative where people can stay in their communities and still um i mean have an interesting challenging mm -hmm. job yeah definitely um now to speak about the plutus ebook I, I just first wanted to ask the question um what is the main difference between plutus and haskell because plutus is based on haskell if i understand well right. what, is, what are the key differences well, I mean, first of all, you're right. I mean, as a language, Plutus is almost equal to Haskell. It's not, I mean, mm -hmm. there are some technical differences, but uh, it's more the, the application. So, so Plutus is our smart contract language. So it, yeah. it will run on the blockchain. Yeah. So whereas oh, Haskell is a normal uh, general oh, okay. purpose programming okay. language. Okay. Okay. So, so Plutus is not only actually, I mean, it's a bit vague what exactly we mean by Plutus, but it's not only the language, it's also the ecosystem and the way it works, how how smart, smart contracts actually work um, in, in Cardano will work. So that is also called Plutus. And the, the language itself is only a part of it. So yeah, it's the okay. whole infrastructure. The yeah. Yes, okay. yes, exactly. Okay, definitely. Um, and so Plutus and uh, Haskell are pretty similar. Um, so what is actually Plutus, so it's a framework in, in a kind of ecosystem of all these things. Is it so you have the language, you have the tools, you have the smart contracts? Right. I mean, it's very similar, but it's not the same. So there is actually a basically you take Haskell and Haskell gets translated into Plutus, but because they are very similar, there is not a big uh, gap. So, so in principle, you can think of the Plutus mm -hmm. programs you write in terms of your Haskell experience, which is good. And um, so Right, and so Plutus is then, I mean, it's this one part where a piece of Haskell code is translated into Plutus, and then it's also the infrastructure that then bundles that up with the transaction and deploys it on the blockchain. And and then, of course, during validation, transaction validation, this code has to be executed by nodes and so on. But uh, what is great about this thing that it's very similar to Haskell is that we don't have this gap that, for example, Solidity has. Um, I mean, there the Solidity is one language that runs on-chain, and but for to to interface with smart contracts off chain, um, you have to use JavaScript, for example. Mm -hmm. So there are two yeah. different languages in play, and um, our idea, or one of the ideas with Plutus, was to that basically everything is Haskell. I mean, it's admittedly a steep yeah. learning curve to to get there. But once you know Haskell, then in principle you, you don't do have to change languages and can yeah. do everything. Definitely. Sorry. That's a, yeah, yeah, definitely. That's a really interesting way of doing things, and I, th I think it's also. It just makes more sense actually to have one language instead of using a multiple language to have one thing right it might i mean of course as i said it's it's you have to first learn haskell yeah. so we are also i'm not completely sure but i think we're also considering like writing different compilers that compile to plutus that for example you could use scala to compile to plutus or so i'm not sure or maybe even solidity something like that to, to make it easier for people but i mean the core idea was to to have this uniform landscape or framework where everything is Haskell. And don't you think, uh, I, I know there is moral law for that also, but mm -hmm. don't you think Haskell is um, too difficult? Because I, I heard it's one of the most difficult languages um, in the world. Don't you think that's kind of like an obstacle to adoption for developers, if I may say it like that? Um... First of all, I don't think that it's true that Haskell is the most... Mm -hmm. It depends, of course, how you find difficult. But um, I mean, it, there is this aspect that I mentioned earlier, this unusual way of thinking. So that yeah. might, of course, be difficult for a lot of people, understandably. But uh, from other point of view, I mean, for example, C++ is, uh, I think, a much more difficult language. So it depends how you look at it. I mean, Haskell yeah. doesn't have that many keywords, for example. So it's, and the theory is relatively clear cut and clean and easy. Uh, that's the one thing. So I, I would not necessarily agree that it's so difficult. Uh, on the other hand, also, you don't really need advanced Haskell features to program in Plutus. I mean, there's this one technical thing, how you actually translate Haskell to Plutus. It uses something called template Haskell, which is relatively advanced, but that is also only used 
always in the same way to, to get from Haskell to Plutus code. And apart from that, I mean, all these things that people are scared about, about Haskell, these monads and that you don't really, really need to write Plutus context. So you can, what we call a Haskell 98 in principle, which is the, was the first Haskell standard without all the fancy features that were added later on. So in principle, it, it's quite straightforward. So, so if you only know basic Haskell, then in principle, you can write Plutus. And I'm also sure that we will make it simpler over time. I mean, it's still cutting mm -hmm. edge and it changes every week a bit and actively doing research on it. But I think eventually it will also be as easy as possible. So we try to hide all the advanced stuff as, as far as it's possible so that um, you can just concentrate on writing the logic of your contracts. And that only uses um, standard Haskell, which isn't very very complicated or advanced, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And in course with Haskell and Solidity, what are what are the key differences? Because yeah, Solidity, you have to use also other languages to mm -hmm. uh, create things off chain. But are there anything, will you be able to do things with Haskell that you wouldn't be able to do with Solidity? Or what are the differences? Well, the, the main hope that we have is that we can actually prove stuff about our contracts. So, um, mm -hmm. I mean, that's not there yet, but the language is designed in a way, I mean, because it has this mathematical foundation, yeah. and this um, system F omega, some lambda calculus thing, um, which is very well defined and very well understood. So the, the hope is that you that it will be possible to to prove certain properties of your contracts for example that no money will lock forever in a contract marlo actually already has that feature i mean marlo is mm -hmm. you mentioned that before is built on plutus uh, on top of plutus or you can implement it in plutus actually and they have very nice guarantees out of the box for example that no money can forever be locked in a contract and things like that and so so mm -hmm. our hope is that um it's it's possible eventually to, to prove properties like that. Or for example, that no matter what happens, uh, in which order people interact and do stuff, that uh, certain conditions will never be met. I mean, so for example, that like the famous or infamous DAO hack on Ethereum, that one mm -hmm. could prove yeah. even this contract, it won't be possible for somebody that uh, to ever get more money out than he put in first or something like that. And um, right, so so that's the hope that the language is designed in a way that makes these formal methods possible to, to apply to them and actually prove things. So, uh, about Marlow, um, it's been on the website that it's for made for financial applications. Yes. Are there any specific things in language which make that it fits more for a financial application than, for example, a game? Or how is yes, indeed? So, um I earlier when I talked about Haskell, I said you can in every language you can do anything. It's just maybe yeah. less fun because because most um, I mean that's this technical term too incomplete, which basically means you can do everything. And Marlow, and that I mean of course if you have a general programming language that you use, you would want it to be too incomplete to to be able to do write every program you want basically. But um, that comes with. Uh, disadvantages as well because I mean there's this famous halting problem I don't know whether you've uh, heard about that so basically Alan, Alan Turing in the 30s before there even were computers he proved that if you have a Turing compute language there are certain things you can't automatically decide about a program so for example mm -hmm. you can't write a program that takes as input another program and decides whether that other program will crash or not so there are certain things because the language is so powerful it's too incomplete basically some things you can only find out about a program by actually running it. You can't find out by just inspecting it. And so that means if you're interested in, in proving things about your programs, it's actually difficult or impossible for two incomplete languages. So Marlow is not one of these general purpose languages. It's specifically been designed for financial contracts. Mm -hmm. And it's in particular, it's not too incomplete. So, and that means it's not, you can't write games in it, or at mm -hmm. least not, not really, I mean, maybe some, maybe some, but <laughs> um, for example, um, one of the things is there is never an endless loop. So every Marlow contract will stop. Whereas, I mean, a Turing complete language, as I said, halting problem, um, they can get into infinite loops, but Marlow contracts never can. So they will always only have finitely many steps and then stop. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that, 
I mean, it's it's less powerful. It's it's designed just to do one thing well, the financial contracts. Mm -hmm. But because it's less powerful, it's it's uh, possible to do analysis, uh, improve stuff much more, much easier than you would for uh, for, for more powerful language. Mm -hmm. Yes, so, so it has been specifically designed to, to do this one thing well and specifically been restricted to so certain things you can't do, like infinite loops. But that actually means that you can write much more powerful static analysis tools that you couldn't for, for arbitrary or for more general languages. And then you can automatically prove interesting properties of your contracts, like no money can ever uh, be forever locked. I am. Um, mm -hmm. I taught a course at our local university here some weeks ago about smart contracts, and I did a lot of solidity examples. And there in class, so I played around with the test net, and I lost a lot of test money <laughs> by just <laughs> doing stupid things like, yeah. I mean, calling methods in the wrong order, and then I couldn't get it out of the contract again. I mean, it was fun, of course, and not important. And uh, but I mean, it can happen easily if you're not careful. And mm -hmm. one of the, and for example, you can then with Marlow, you can guarantee that it won't happen, things like that. So okay. uh, that, that's the beauty of Marlow. And it's also we talked about the um, the different difficult uh, the steep learning curve uh, Haskell and Plutus earlier, and Marlow is is uh, is designed to to not have that problem. So the idea is that you don't even have to be a computer scientist or, or um, software engineer to to use Marlow. So the hope is that basically financial engineers of uh, finance finance people can can yeah. use it. yeah it's more simple than yes other types of languages yeah um now in regards with the plus ebook um what was the goal uh, what's the goal with the plus ebook is it an introduction to plus is it for already more advanced developers or with, with the audience yes it's an introduction to plutus but we did not write an introduction to Haskell. So, so for the ebook, we assumed okay. a certain knowledge of Haskell, mm -hmm. um, but but no knowledge of Plutus or any other smart contract language. Yeah. Okay. And uh, is it a success? Do Do you know how many people <laughs> bought it yeah. or downloaded it? I well, we have we have it on two platforms. We have it on Amazon and on LeanPub. Yeah. Um, yes, uh, yeah. And on LeanPub, I know it's. It's last free, time I checked it, oh, sorry, uh, yeah, it's free, it's free, yes. Yeah. We would have made it free on Amazon as well, but somehow uh, Amazon doesn't allow that, so you have to have a minimum amount. Mm -hmm. So, so, but on LeanPub, it's free. And uh, there, I know, last time I checked, which was some weeks ago, it was more than 500 people that had downloaded it. So I don't know whether that's a huge success or not, but I, uh, I, did, <laughs> I did publish my PhD thesis as a book. Uh, 15 years ago, and I think in those 15 years, I have less copies sold than you know, about three months. <laughs> it's a bit more technical, I suppose. To, yes, so. it is. Less so I'm fun. quite happy about that. And if you add in the Amazon, so I suppose maybe a thousand or so. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, which is not bad for, for beginning. Right. But definitely. OK, thank you very much for coming on the show, Lars. It was a real pleasure to have you here. And be able to speak with you uh, about the variety of topics. I generally appreciate it. Um, I think you are really doing one of the most interesting jobs at IOHK because it's really the poor strategy of adoption in Africa and in these regions where people often don't have the um, the chance of yeah le learning and really being able to participate in in this revolution which blockchain is mm -hmm. thank you very much for having me on the show it was very interesting it was a pleasure thank community you audience, we'll meet next week for a new episode on take Cardano uh, community podcast so stay tuned and bye thank you